Hey guys, I'm live with Dr. Reza. He is an endodontist. I'm sure you've all seen his uh, Instagram profile already. Endogenie, he's one of the kind of most interesting guys that I've spoken to on the 24 hour podcast, which he did for RCF. Uh, so thank you for joining me for that. And thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jabir. It's great to be here. Um, you know, I, I too had a lot of uh, fun. I think the RCF podcast and it was so difficult to get it right. And I think it was executed brilliantly. So kudos to you. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a fan of yours as well. Right back at you. I love your Instagram uh, feed, you know, with your pictures and your photography, your eye for them. Thank you. So uh, it, it's great to be in your orbit. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, we have Dr. Brett, of course, to thank for that, because uh, he he kind of uh, he pushed me. He's like, oh, I know someone who'll be really good to come on with me and, and Karina, you know, f first up on the RCF podcast, which was I actually, I think I fluked it, I'll be honest. Like, I, I don't know how we managed that without any major technical glitches. Um, it's been it's been hit and miss since, especially since I changed a lot of the equipment around. It's, it's funny how changing equipment and changing technology uh, can oh, screw yeah. things up, even though something is working perfectly and you've plugged in a new camera and everything goes to, you know, goes to crap somehow. But I think we've, we've clocked it again now. So, uh, yeah, and... The RCF thing, of course, was uh, a really great cause, and I'm really kind of happy for um, the opportunity from the charity to let me get involved. So, uh, a big shout out to those guys if uh, if anyone's not already seen it and not already uh, aware of them. Absolutely. Yeah. Also, it's your birthday today, isn't it? So happy birthday! And you kind of surprised me with that. So uh, <laughs> you kept it quiet. So. You know, happy birthday, and I hope you have a really good one. Thank you. You know, everybody I talk to, it's it's a milestone birthday. It's my 50th. And, um, you know, everybody I talk to, you know, leading up to it, you know, friends and family are like, well, you have a big one coming up. It's 50th. That's a huge milestone. And I think to myself, I'm like, listen, let's be very honest. I could see 20 being a milestone. You're no longer a teenager. 30s, you know, you're entering into adulthood. I could see 70s and 80s for still being alive. <laughs> But he's in 60s for some reason. I mean, what's really the benefit of that? You're kind of in that no man's land. You know, it's just a it's just another day. But uh, thank you. Thank you. And it is my birthday. And uh, as I said, uh, Jabir, you're the second person today on my birthday. I'm having a conversation with the first one being my wife. So uh, that should uh, that should count. Yeah, th um, I'm very honored. And uh, it's funny that you. Oh, sorry. <clears throat> it's funny that you say, you know, uh, the landmark birthdays because I think I, you know in the next couple of years I'm I'm coming up to thirty and it's gonna, more going to be like um, why aren't you married yet or something like that. That's kind of the comment I'm going to be getting. I can I can just feel it even though it's not here yet. I know that's what the uh, that's what the occasion is going to be more about as opposed to oh yeah well done for being you know thirty years old and or anything like that. I'm not a huge birthday person myself actually, so uh, I'm I'm not shocked that you're just you know uh, it's it's another day. I'm I'm actually not either. I never have been. I don't like kind of spotlight on me for that reason. But just to give you a glimpse, 30s, you're OK. I think you're going to get that marriage chat. 40s, I think eyesight's going to start going. And then 50s, everybody tells me the warranty on every part of your body is going to expire. <laughs> so you just have to kind of wing it and see if it lasts or not. But um, but yeah, it's just another day. I'm I'm, I'm I'm happy to be healthy and happy to have a job and happy to kind of have healthy people around me with sort of COVID and 2020, but I'm ready for this year to end. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Modesto really says, uh, happy birthday. Thank you for joining us, Modesto, by the way. Uh, Thanks, and yeah, I think, I think everyone's just about ready for this COVID nightmare to be over and, uh, to be able to go back to doing the things that we love, you know, going to, uh, conferences, we can meet people like yourself and Dr. Brett and, uh, you know, everyone else who's, you know, interesting out there and, and just meeting new colleagues. So uh, I certainly can't wait for it. I think uh, in a way the COVID period has been, it's been good personally for me. I've been able to connect with a lot of people that otherwise wouldn't have had the time to to sit on their phones and, and laptops to, to chat. But uh, for sure, we want to get back out in the real world. Absolutely. I think it's, one of the best things about it is it just makes you appreciate a lot of the things that you took for granted before COVID. Mm. 
And um, I think that's, uh, I think we'll be better. Uh, as a human race, we'll be better from this experience. Minus, of course, the tragic lives that have been lost. But, uh, but yeah, this is, um, I'm with you, man. Ready for this thing to end. Yeah, I, I think I'm going to have a, a bit of a crazy travel bug experience afterwards. I'm, I'm kind of itching to get back out there for sure. Um, but should, should we talk a little bit about your, your career? Because you've been in practice for 20 odd years. You've done a BDS in, or is it DDS in, in, in Canada? It's, uh, well, it's from the U S it's DMD. Oh, DMD um, which, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, my can my Canada journey was really my um, college experience, university studies after high school. I grew up in Florida, and then um, there's an interesting story with uh, with where I ended up going, which was McGill. You know, so senior year for all the the students that uh, studied in the U.S., they know it's a grueling task to apply for universities. The application has one, two, or and checked by guidance counselors. And this is like, we're talking 1989, which I was when I was a senior in high school. And uh, each application is like $50, $60 at that time, which is a lot of money. Mm. So you have to be selective about how many schools you want to apply. And on the average, you know, students apply to seven or eight colleges. And I applied to all of them. I applied to six colleges. I was joined because I loved Washington, D.C., at that time, Georgetown had a very good basketball program, and they were very hit. Fire, and so all the reasons. That, and, and I was a shoe in for Georgetown. I had an uncle that lived in Toronto, and he said, "You know what? You should apply to McGill. I'm like McGill, McGill, it's as good as Harvard. It's the best university yeah. in Canada." I didn't think anything of it. I was watching Jeopardy that night or the night after. And the category was colleges and universities. And Alex Trebek says, this university is known as the Harvard of Canada. And the answer was Miguel. I'm like, this has got to be a sign. You know, I have, I've not heard of this university twice from two different sources. And so I sent out for the application, Jabir. And what made me apply was the fact the application took five minutes to finish. It was just demographic data, right. no essays. And it was $15 at that time. I'm like, no harm, no foul. Let's just give it a shot. So I applied. I got in. And that was four years of, of blissful experience at Montreal. So just a really simple application experience is, you know, kind of, oh, well, you know, not have to write essays and take tests and all these things that I think everyone has to do now. I don't think there's anywhere that will that'll get away with a, a little short demographic quiz almost. And then... Uh, yeah. And then pretty pretty cheap as well compared to the other one. So I think that's that sounds pretty good. And what was it like moving from somewhere like Florida, moving all the way up to you know Canada, where it's got to be a little chillier, right? I didn't know what to expect. My mom packed, I want to say, two suitcases, just sweaters, yeah. and not enough. The first year. The with wind chill, it was minus 40 degrees. Oh, no. To the point outside more than minutes, otherwise you get frostbite. But, you know, it, it was a great experience. Um, I, I met a, a great ton of people from all over the world. I interacted a lot with Canadians who I have the most immense respect for. Very, very intelligent, very nice people. And, um, yeah, uh, it, those were the best four years of my life. And I had a chance to actually go back to Montreal, we had the AAE, the Annual Association of Endodontists meeting, uh, May of 2019, it was in Montreal, and it was just so much memorable for me to go back, walk the neighborhood where I used to live, where the dormitories were, where my faculty uh, of sciences building, the physics building, where the physics building was. So it was, a, it was a great way to kind of catch up. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's really strange, because obviously I've uh, only just finished so I think it's been, it's coming up to 10 years since I applied, but even, even if I think, oh, wow, I started university 10 years ago, that's, that's gone like in the blink of an eye. And, and, you know, it is weird to, if I were to go back now, um, you know, none of the people that I was there with will be, will be there now, you know, they've all moved on apart from maybe a few, you know, majority of the professors I would, I would assume. Um, but it's very strange how 
you know you can have these memories with uh, about people that were you know once there and you know everyone's gone off to do their different things now um so it's actually been i think two years since i've been to to newcastle so it'll be it'll be a while till i actually manage to go back but uh, i kind of can't wait yeah every with time it's just a lot more precious so you'll just be able to appreciate this for years to come mm. Yeah, because we do spend, you know, I spent almost seven years in Newcastle, so it was it was like you know second home. You know, I, I know that in the back of you know the the city like the back of my hand, and you know all the places that I would go for for meals or you know for for a chill with friends, and you know uh, all these other things that you would you'd go off and do to the beach or you know, and just you know your life that you that was there. Uh, it's very strange that that time just goes and it's like a whole new chapter and you were living in a different way of life. You know, the student life is very, um, it's a different, it's different to any other kind of time in your life. I don't think you'll ever have that time where four or five, you know, you can walk out the street and then you'll see seven or eight people that you know and have a chat, you know, before you manage to get to where you're trying to go. Um, yeah. very, it's very, it's very strange, but actually really, really good at the same time. Absolutely. I think we were talking about that in the in the before we went live. We're like, you know, just a simple life. Yeah. No responsibilities. You just had to kind of you had a regimented schedule, and really, just it's 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 such a free time in your life. Mm. Yeah, and of course, you know, if it's lectures, then uh, sometimes if you're uh, not so uh, studious, you may not have uh, gone to them. <laughs> I can't tell you how many eight o'clock classes I skipped just because I wanted to sleep in, you know, but uh, that's all part of the memory. That was all great. Stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I went through a patch of that. I'll, I'll be honest. But the, the thing is, you know, once you've once you miss one, you go, oh, what's another? And then the nine, the yes. nine and the ten go as well. And you go, yeah, I'll, exactly. I'll come in for I'll come in for the lunchtime lecture. Why not? <laughs> uh, it's and a it, dangerous path to tread, I think. It is, and it was it was it was well orchestrated uh, and designed at McGill because it's a large university; it's thirty thousand people. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. first year biology class, there were six hundred people in that class. Wow! You were nothing more than an identification number. So it was easy to do that, much easier than if it was a class of fifteen or twenty, where it's so blatantly obvious if you're missing in a class. Yeah, I think I think they're cottoning onto that kind of thing now. You have to scan your card in and stuff at the door sometimes, and uh, yeah. <laughs> they're catching on to our tricks exactly exactly yeah um so you did dentistry at mcgill as well or did you move move on no yeah i i, I did my bachelor's uh in physics at mcgill and i did my dentistry um a, in boston i did it at tufts university okay. i graduated uh 1998 um and Boston, in a lot of ways, was the first experience for me because um, uh, having moved there from from Montreal, it was a very nice transition because it was a very European, eclectic city with its population. You know, there are a hundred universities within mile radius of Boston, and wow. a, a, a tremendous international population. And um, the city's small; it's walkable. It's cold, but not as cold as Montreal. So it was a very nice transition for me. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and it was a good time at Tufts. It was tough. Uh, then I did a year of general practice residency. We call that GPR. Yeah. And then I came back into Boston and I worked as a general dentist for five years and uh, learned a lot, did a lot, loved dental materials at the time. Bonding, cosmetics and endodontics were kind of my, my, my passion. And then after five years, I decided, you know what, I just want to really focus on endo. Um, and, um, I wanted to just go to Boston university. There was Tufts there, there was Harvard there, but, uh, the history and, uh, sort of the city was, I applied and I didn't get in, uh, and, uh, I am, um, you know what Reza, I really like you. I'm just, my space is full this year. I pr promise you. Just apply again, and I have a space for you next right. year. So, I the rest is history. Did endo at Boston, uh, moved to the Washington D.C. area, and I've been practicing. Yeah, I'm just on the map now, checking where Boston is on the map. 
because uh, my American geography is not the best, shall we say. Uh, so yeah, it is quite it is quite north. I don't know why I, th I thought like Boston was much more of a, a southern city for some reason. <laughs> no, it's it's a six hour drive south of Montreal. Yeah. So we're kind of halfway between New York and, and Canada border sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So obviously you've got, you, you did the, you know, that, that decision process and you've done a bit of cosmetics and you've done some, some bonding work and all that kind of thing. What drove you off of that and say, you know, I'm going to do something which is completely non, you know, it's not, it's not cosmetic at all. Is it? And it's, it's very technical. It's the very technical side of dentistry. There's no, um, there's no gen member of the general public who goes, I know exactly what an endodontist does. And it's, uh, it's like something that, oh yeah, I wouldn't mind having that. You know, it's something that they come to as a, as a last resort. Yes. Um, your app are just, uh, so different and distinct, you know, cosmetic dentistry, you had, uh, immediate gratification from patient satisfaction. Mm. Um, and, and you just don't have that, but I guess with endo, the service you're providing in the sense of getting someone out of pain or, or, or healing them from a disease process uh, is really where the gratification comes from. They come to you in pain and you, you provide what appears to be an underwhelming experience for them because they come in with a lot of baggage, yeah. a lot of emotional perceptions of what a powerful it is. And I think the challenge that, that it's kind of like that carrot stick that gets dangled in front of you is the fact that you want to make this an underwhelming experience you want to take care of the patient as a whole whether it's pain or disease process or infection and then the technical aspect of it the fact that you're working in small spaces the fact that there are challenges in front of you that are not only unique to the tooth but unique to the patient uh, i think there's so mentions of, of complexity compared to my perception of cosmetic dentistry that really intrigued me and uh the only gratification is what cliff ruddle said thrill of the fill the radiograph mm. and no matter how um scrutinizing you are on yourself you're going to be happy or not most of the time but that's really it and once in a while you get an email acknowledgement from the patient saying this was the best experience and i think that is really what it's all about yeah because it's it's the same sort of thought that I'm having, you know, the same sort of th thought process where I've done a couple of years and, you know, I, I've, I, you know, I feel most comfortable when I'm doing an endo, something which is much more technical as opposed to, you know, using the painting brushes to try and get a smooth composite veneer or, um, you know, any sort of bonding work, which is cosmetic. I, it, it kind of, it, you know, it was, it, there is a thrill of doing that kind of work. I think, you know, you get that really vivid change in a person's you know self-confidence and you know how they feel about themselves but at the end of the day you you start coming up against i feel more problems because you get more and more demanding patients and it becomes more of a headache to me and i think like that's something that i felt that would be detrimental in the long term could you and could you keep on doing that kind of work where people keep on coming back and keep on coming back saying the shape of this is not right the shade is a little bit off or um this one's pinged off or you know i broke it because i was having a i don't know you bit into a t-bone or something like that you know it, it's all these different things that in my head just go you know I, I i almost can't be bothered to deal with that side you know there's a lot more patient management um, when i when i think about what i enjoy about dentistry it is much more technical can i do something which is very difficult as opposed to can i manage someone who is difficult yeah um i think you basically nailed it i and i think that uh initially you know one of the reasons that endo was very appealing to me was you're in control of everything from start to finish. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's basically on your technical know-how in order to achieve the intended purpose. And if something fails, it's on you. And I think for, for, on, on one hand, that was very gratifying because when you look at the other phases of dentistry, cosmetic dentistry, 
their lab materials, their shape mismatches from the lab, there's bonding issues, there's patient expectations issues, and, he, and you're kind of all over the place, and I could see that. But really, having been an endodontist for 13 years, um, you still find challenges in someone coming back and saying this isn't right or this doesn't feel right. And one thing I learned from a practice management coach years ago, uh, Jabir, was a simple formula. Employ this formula and you'll be set. The formula is this, expectation minus reality equals upset. If someone's expectation of something is far different, they're facing, they're going to be upset. So it's really all about informed consent. It's about setting the patient up ahead of time. Yeah. You want to hope for the best, but you want to plan for the worst. And I think if you set their expectations, it should help in almost any area of, of dentistry that you practice in. Yeah, I, I kind of uh, would agree because you, if you tell someone from day one, this is going to be the maximum you can achieve and you stick with that and you don't maybe waver and say, oh, maybe we could do a bit more, then they only, they will only ever hear the best that they can have. And then they never kind of will accept anything lower than that unless you get someone who's very, very kind of very realistic. And a lot of the time when someone forks out X thousand dollars, X thousand pounds, then they're expecting a service. And a lot of the time, yes, it is a service, but it's also, you know, medical treatment, which is, uh, it has its risks and pitfalls and considerations that we have to take into account. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, um, yeah, that's been kind of, uh, that kind of my journey along the way. I've always loved teaching. Teaching has always been a passion of mine. It's like the best way that I can express myself, teach or share some of the stuff that's worked for me or hasn't over the years. And as soon as I went, went back to Boston uh, to practice as a general dentist, I reserved uh, one day a week, Mondays, to go to the clinic cuffs and teach in the Department of Restorative Dentistry. So I did that. And uh, they don't pay. Uh, they never do. To this day, I, I still teach if I once in a while at Maryland, there's no pay. They don't even pay for your parking. But I think the, the students appreciate it. And I think that kind of making that difference to a student is worth more than any amount of money that you can potentially get paid. So I've always enjoyed teaching and um, went sort of on uh, the regional, somewhat national lecture circuit with a couple of companies, Densply, Serona. Uh, uh, I've been a key opinion leader since 2009. Yeah. So I lecture for them on their new products. I beta test the new products. Uh, I've now of SS White. I think SS White just is unbelievable when it comes to rotary files. Okay, and let me have a look. I'm, I'm going to do a quick Google search about that. When when you start doing the teaching, did you start um, at undergrad level or did you go into more of a uh, endodontic, uh, you know, le you know, um, residency level teaching? Um, so when I was a general dentist and between 1999 and 2005, it was at the undergraduate dental clinic, the, the pre-doctoral students. Yeah. Um, as an endodontist at University of Maryland, uh, it, it's been to the endo residence. Um, I did that from 2009 till about 2015. And then um, since 2009, it's been lecturing to general dentists uh, that have a passion or an interest in improving their endo. Okay, very, very similar to, to Brett because uh, I went on his course in um in the midwinter meeting actually it was it was my uh, first it's actually the first time that i'd been on a course outside of uh, dental school um the first time i'd paid for a course and uh it kind of made me it, it made my decision for me actually that actually i can sit with a guy who's not gonna you know show us anything hands-on for a full day nine till five it was a lecture and it was brett talking the whole time which i think is quite ridiculous and crazy and i'm very impressed that he managed it but he, he spoke for full nine till five and only in the last 45 minutes did i start to drop off just out of sheer tiredness because the day before me and my friend had walked for 12 hours in uh in Chicago, just trying to drink in all the sites because we had four or five days in Chicago, three of which were midwinter, two of which were um, 
go and see this, go and see this uh, the place so um the only reason that i actually started flagging was because i probably needed a coffee and didn't want to get up and leave um, and, and yeah. so, so yeah it's just one of those brett is uh the uh the consummate uh, professional and expert when it comes to teaching. Yeah. I have not met a single person uh, that has more passion about this, genuine, authentic passion, not driven by marketing or money. He just genuinely loves to teach. And and I got that sense from him when interacting with him and meeting him. And, uh, you know, we kind of expanded our space, uh, Jabir, uh, about a year ago uh, to include a full-time demonstration operatory with uh, 3D uh, microscope. Oh, so wow. viewers are in an adjoining conference room that's separated by glass. You can even open the partition glass and be immersed in it. And on a 75 inch screen, they put on the goggles and they're actually in the treatment. You can kind of see what we're doing. And uh, Brett and I were talking about doing our course together and we came up and looked at the place and we were all set to do it and then COVID hit. So things are kind of on the back burner. But I'm really excited to kind of partner up with Brett and and, uh, and pick up a little bit of his energy when he's teaching. Yeah, I mean, it, it's funny how these things work because had on that day I'd not been walking around so much, uh, I'd actually bruised my foot uh, because I was wearing loafers, which was the worst, you know. I don't know why I didn't take any trainers with me when I went to, to Chicago, so I should have worn trainers the day before. But as a result, my foot... Was my foot was bruised. Your is very formal, that's why. <laughs> yeah, but as a result, my foot was bruised, so I couldn't go upstairs and walk around the uh, exhibition. So I kind of hobbled over and just, you know, just plonked myself on the chair next to Brett. I was like, oh, uh, that, was, that was a really interesting morning, Brett. Thank you. And then we kind of got to talking. And then as you've seen, we've uh, we've linked up on Instagram lives and podcasts a number of times since so it's really it's really interesting and amusing to me in a way how how these little connections begin just out of if I hadn't done this something really silly then something good wouldn't have happened same same way that deaths of Inter started if had I not failed my finals I wouldn't have had that time to start it and then had you know all these knock-on effects of speaking to yourself wouldn't have happened. So um, it's, it's, it's really, I don't know what the word is when, when you screw something up and it turns out better for you. There needs to be a word for that, I think. Silver lining. Yeah. There's silver lining in it. Yeah. That's, that's really it. You're absolutely These right. These SS white birds, I've just had a little look. Um, so what do you like about them? Um, I love the fact that, you know, it's truly a 21st century file. I think almost every file company from the early 1990s when rotary instrumentation became apparent, everyone just started to build on what was there before and incrementally make it better. SSY took a completely different approach. They understand that preserving pericervical dentin is important. Yeah. So they have a modified tape, the, they have uh, really the most uh, um, flattering metallurgy you could possibly find. The, 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 in, in anybody's hands, those rotary files are so gentle. Uh, it has no shape memory, right? so you can bend it 90 degrees uh, in a tight access, insert it, and it's just so soft that it will bend a thousand times before it will break. I've just been enjoying really using their files. And um, I uh, have been in talks with uh, sort of the uh, national sales manager for them to kind of give a webinar on some of these. But most of the cases that uh, I've posted now uh, are, have been really as a result of SS White. You can kind of see that in the evolution of the cases I've to be versus the shapes that they are now. And I'm just really, really uh, happy with where they've taken um, – the profession in the arena of shaping. Right. So, uh, Medusa Ali says the scout sounds a bit scratchy. Let me just see if I can, uh, rectify that. I'm just going to mute myself.
Right, I, th I think it should be okay now. Uh, hope I've just up upped the bit rate. So uh, yeah, so, sorry about that. Yeah, so the the so they're actually more conservative with your access around that pericervical denting, which can lead to a better long term outcome and strength of the tooth. And you know we don't want to be taking away more and more, do we? So that sounds really interesting. I I'll definitely check those out. And and it's 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 all. I don't think it's the UK yet. From what I was talking to um, a couple of friends of mine, uh, Mango's Endo House, <clears throat> Contemporary Endo, I don't think the taper is the line of files, uh, Denton conser Conservation tapered files have made it, but I think they're close to, um, and uh, you have to buy it from kind of overseas. Um, but yeah, they and they've really just focused their entire vision around uh, Orthodontically treated teeth maximally. They have these access spurs uh, called the endo access spurs, and uh, it complements sort of the shaping strategy. Now, I do want to say, you know, we don't want to overcorrect. We don't want to oversteer. Yes, really obnoxiously large access is a problem. Really opening uh, the orifice up with Gates Glidden's three and four is bad, but it doesn't mean that ninja access is necessarily the way to go. Because in the wrong hands, or in the hands of someone who's not as experienced, you can leave a lot of tissue and bacteria and debris behind, and it's going to fail for a different reason. So if we were to try to find that, that happy middle ground, I like where SSY is at. Okay, yeah, because obviously we've seen, um, you know, a lot of shouting about gentle wave in the endodontic community, and, and it does have its like we spoke about on, on the 24-hour podcast, you know, Brett's, Brett's been using it and he's seen some cases where you think it's not going to do anything and it's perfect for those cases and other cases where you think it's a shoe in and it's not quite done the job that you would have hoped. But all these tools are, it's good that we have more and more tools, I think, because it, it means that there's more and more cases that we can potentially, um, you know, help. And then that's, that's the whole, that's the whole point behind it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, so um, that just says it's worse now. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what's going on with the sound again. Um, let me have a little look. Well, you sound great uh, to me and, and vice versa. Yeah, it's the link between the software Skype. and yeah, the soft, either Skype and the software or um, or the upload to, to YouTube. Something goes on, which is funny. Just have a little quick look. Sure. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. We'll, we'll have to try and work through it. I'm just going to drop on a fill to see if that helps us out. How's it sounding now, Muda, sir? Yeah, th this is the the issue that it, it didn't happen for the whole twenty four hour podcast, but for some reason, uh, ever since it's it's a little hit and miss. Um, we'll have to we'll have to see how it goes. But yeah, you were talking about uh, the the use of uh, d different different access sizes within within dentistry um and obviously we we shouldn't all be doing that unless we're you know suitably experienced where do you think that kind of level starts to come in is that something that you kind of know inherently because you obviously gone through that that process of being you know less experienced and then you've gone into your endo and then you you know done more and more and now you 
teaching and things like that. Uh, how long has it taken you to get to that level where you know, okay, I, I can get away with a much smaller access today, or, or actually, I, I maybe need to open things up a bit more. Um, it's interesting the the knowledge and experience graph. If you were to look at it, one one access will be your actual expertise in the field. The other access will be your perception of your expertise. You'll find that there, there's an inverse relationship. So when you're right out of school, you feel you know it all. You feel you're the shit. You feel like nothing's going to be able to, uh, to conquer. I got it. And I'm actually hearing a little bit of. Uh... Are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I think we just cut out for a second, didn't we? I'm I'm hearing a little bit of feedback. Uh, uh am I okay now? Your your voice is fine. It's like a background noise. Um, Do you know what it is? Oh, there's there's a guy. The the guys next door are, are digging things up. Okay, okay. No, that I want to make sure you're you're okay. That that might be it. Um, yeah. So yeah, you know, I think the challenge is when you're coming out to have your, your ego and your bravado not take over, to be ungrounded. Um, it took me probably four to five years to felt comfortable in managing anything in Endo. And, and felt is different than being able to. You know, I had the confidence level. Um, the, and, but really, I would probably say... Um, seven to eight years minimum before I could really control um, most conditions to my suiting. Wow. Um, but the problem with access, uh, Jabir, is access was design was created in the 60s and 70s. And it's unbelievable that Endo has gone through so much evolution, technology update and, and, and whatnot. The access hasn't changed. They're still teaching the same access they did in the 60s and 70s. The reason why the access was designed that way in the 60s and 70s was because we had no magnification and we had very terrible disinfectants mm. and we had no rotary instrumentation. So you had to make things big enough so you made sure you didn't miss it. But now that we have all the other areas covered, technology, vision, microscopes, loops, lighting source, um, shaping instruments, why not tidy things up? Yeah, yeah, it's it's true. I, I think maybe new dentists have to go through that same sort of period of, of learning because it's it's not easy. You know, de endodontics is probably the dark art of dentistry as much as, much as you know, dentures are. Um, yeah. So I, I think you do have that stepwise kind of, learning curve and you know you'll you probably start off thinking you're the, the best thing on, in the world like you said you know then then you realize how much you've been screwing up and and then you get on top of it and eventually you get to an actual position where you're you're pretty com competent yeah um, and obviously the more the more bits of technology like we spoke about microscopes and uh, you know all these other things the more bits of technology you bring in the easier it's going to be to um, optimize your conditions for working and, and optimize the, the tooth and, and how it's going to um, eventually improve the results that you're getting, I think. Absolutely, yeah. Where does all of this fit in? Because then you have at some point, you know, thought about, okay, well, how can I help all these other dentists? Because, you know, you've been doing some teaching. Where's the app fit into all this? Because we we do need some sort of tool for endodontic diagnosis, and it can be confusing, you know, if you patients saying lots and lots of different things. So, where where did you have that idea? Where did it come from, and where do you think it's going to go? Um, great question. I think uh, my app, which is centered on artificial intelligence or AI, is really the next big wave. I think it's been um, really hitting the medical profession uh, unbelievably, like a tsunami, and it's done so since 2015, 
and it's now trickling down into dentistry with different applications of it. My um, exposure and interest to it was just something, talk about random and, and completely accidental. On a Sunday, I was reading an article. <coughs> excuse me. Sick. <coughs> I was reading an article in the news about how Google had, this was 2016, 2017, how Google had set up a competition called Kaggle, where software engineers need to come up with a program <clears throat> to see if they can identify a cat versus a dog. And one come on it. And I said to myself, unbelievable, if this technology can differentiate what a cat looks like from a dog and label it appropriately, why not use that in periapical radio? That's been the number one challenge for most practicing dentists in my 12 years of teaching has been how do you read a radiograph correctly? How do you make a correct and accurate endodiagnosis? Mm -hmm. And ever since 2010, I had created a flow chart that I'd give to all the attendees about how the steps to take, what the results mean, how to move forward. And I said to myself, what if we can do this? So I kind of got on a little bit of a, a white paper project with some x-rays. My, my wife's cousin is a brilliant software developer, truly brilliant guy, and he kind of worked with me and we realized there's definitely something. And um, <clears throat> so we set up, we started the company and set up the project, have a uh, beta uh, testing thing on the app, uh, on the iPhone. And um, I thought it was just going to be a great thing. I would be able to, to provide it for people and let them make better, uh, you know, diagnoses. Little did I realize that there are regulatory over hurdles. You know, uh, CE Mark from, from, from Europe, FDA from the U.S., even though this is what appears to be harmless, uh, this it doesn't go in a patient's mouth. The decisions that one can make can be potentially detrimental to the patient. So all of these regulatory health commissions, they want to have a very scrutinizing oversight, very similar to how a vaccine gets mm. developed. It's no different. The paperwork that you go through, the tests that you got to do, the steps that you got to follow. So that's been taking up uh, really the better part of the past eight months, <clears throat> getting our paperwork together, getting tests together uh, to do that. But my vision is for this app to be a companion to you as a as a dentist you're doing a routine checkup on a patient after hygiene you have radiographs in front of you instead of just looking for the obvious ones that have periapical lucency if you're a little unsure about something that you may overlook if the patient's asymptomatic this app will give you a better insight into whether there's a and that's the ultimate vision of of, of the app yeah, I, th I think it's probably quite needed. And if it's able to look at a radiograph and do we input da uh, other data as well? Yeah, to have a full diagnosis, yeah. you'd have to do that. Like results of cold testing. Now, uh, it guides you through what to look for, uh, for an answer, how to ask questions for a patient. But that's the, the big picture vision. With regulatory hurdles, we have to narrow the scope down a little bit and then introduce it in T. So some markets uh, around the world where they don't have the regulatory constraints, uh, for example, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, even India, then um, more features of the app will be available to users. In some of the other countries where there are stricter hurdles, they need to be rolled out in phases. Yeah. Okay. Well, it kind of makes sense, I suppose. You know, some people, some places are a bit more, um, a, a, bit, a bit more on the ball with you know making sure everything's a hundred percent before it comes out, and other places are maybe trying to push push the the boundaries a bit faster. So there's kind of probably pluses and minuses to both both approaches. You know, some places won't benefit for a, a lot longer because of. Um, you know, trying to trying to make sure before it comes out, and some places maybe will um, go down slightly left field routes, and, and maybe find it doesn't help before it's uh, you know before it's been you know fine tuned and stuff like that. So I, I think there's uh, probably pluses and minuses in both situations, right? Yeah, 
uh, and then you know you, you look absolutely. Uh, I, I'm all for following any of the regulatory oversights to ensure that something is safe and compliant and whatnot. But just the mere premise, Jameer, of a radiograph. Historically, and they've done studies in the as early as the late '70s. There is a vast disagreement or inconsistency among different clinicians that look at the same radiograph. Mm. They call that interpret. So how you interpret an X-ray is different than how I would interpret the X-ray, and that's interreader disagreement. Furthermore, what's unbelievable is. There is intra-reader disagreement. You can look at an x-ray today, have an opinion on it, and I can give you the same x-ray a month from now, you'll have a different opinion of it. So the bullseye that we're trying to achieve is really a moving target. And I think that's where this app comes in incredibly handy, is because it gives you that consistency that you don't have from an average human. Sorry, I would mute my microphone. There. I was doing a sound check. Yeah, you're right. The, when when I look at a, a radiograph, you know, the first time I see it and I've taken that radiograph, I, I can have a look and say, oh, it probably looks okay. And then maybe when I'm coming to, you know, review my cases for the day, uh, there'll be times where you get the little magnifying tool up on, on your screen and you maybe change the contrast a little bit and you go, oh, wait a minute, hold on. Is that something there? And then you maybe you, you knock on next door and the the guy working there or, or the girl working there and they go, oh, there's probably nothing. And then someone else will be like, oh, it's a hundred percent something there. So you're right. The, there's a, a very subjective kind of point of view from person to person. Uh, and it's different as, as well for caries. You know, sometimes if you're looking at some caries, you go, oh, that's only into the enamel. We can, we can treat that conservatively with the prevention, you know, fluoride application, uh, or, you know, OHI, flossing, all those kinds of things. And sometimes someone else will go, oh, you have to jump in there. That's that's going to be really big. And, you know, you need we need to get in there and do something. And it's that there's almost no right and wrong answer with those kinds of things. Whereas obviously endodontics, you've, you've either got a problem or you, or you haven't. Um, and I think a lot of the time that's where something like a cone beam comes in really useful because it makes things much, much more clear we can get that 3D, this is the tooth, and now we can see whether there is something or not because you've got that 3D representation of of that. Um, and I think that's probably gold standard, but this is a very good in-between kind of intermediate kind of tool to help, it sounds like. Well, um, I agree with you that the cone beam is looking at at least four times more accurate in predicting periapical issues than a traditional radiograph. But I wouldn't call it a gold standard, and I'll and I'll tell you why. It's because it's not readily accessible around the okay, world. Yeah. I think the gold standard has to be something that is accessible to most. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of cone beam. We were the first office in the entire east coast of the U.S. to have a Merida cone beam CT back in 2008. So we're very early adopters of technology. And we've done probably 25,000 scans over these 12 years. So you kind of learn to kind of see them. But, you know, if you have uh, a, a, a dentist um, somewhere and they don't have access to a CT, or if they do, it may be overkill to CT the entire mouth just to see if there's an issue or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. the radiation cost, time. So what the gold standard is, is... Um, really a good reader of a radiograph. That's the gold standard. How do we apply that gold standard to the day-to-day -day practice? By having artificial intelligence that's been tested independently against ground truth experts, which are board certified radiologists and the images they agree on and seeing what percentage of, of the app diagnosis matches theirs. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a very, interesting challenging but really joyful um project to be one yeah i think i think it's going to be a real help to you know anyone who's wanting that just extra bit of confirmation when you've seen something i think it'll be really really good um does the quality of the x-ray make a difference uh when you're uploading sure. on there because i think that's something that you know if, if someone's using 
analog radi radiology, then maybe we're not getting the best particular image. Or sometimes if patients are, you know, moving, then then that's, you know, blurs things a little bit as well. So that obviously comes into effect as well. So you, you, would it struggle in those particular instances? Well, we've, we've looked into that early on and um, we've trained these uh, machine learning models on really 30 to 40,000 x-rays uh, of different manufacturers, different qualities, including analog. And internally, we have altered extra copies of those images with various modifications like darker, lighter, linear. Uh, so we've really augmentation of the data set. So we've done a lot to really ensure that it's robust. But at the end of the day, if you expose a radiograph that you can't read, you won't know whether you can believe the results from the artificial intelligence or not. Because at the end of the day, you as a dentist need to come to grips with that finding. Hey, I reject that. That's definitely not it. Or, hey, oh, I could see that. But if you have no way of, of being able to assess that independently, then I think it's um, it, you're kind of working without a radar, yes, if you yeah, will. Yeah. So I always say, mm -hmm. make sure your, your radiographs are legible. Make sure you can make diagnosis on your own. You may not know what it is, but make sure it's the information is there. Lamina dura, the, the, the levels of bone, the peri PA cut off, how can you expect the machine learning model to diagnose it? It won't return an error. Yeah. It'll just give yeah. you an answer, but you don't know if that answer is right or not. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you probably have to use your common sense there. Obviously, everyone who's managed to get through dental school should have uh, healthy doses of common sense, so we, we would hope. So so yeah. I'm, I'm sure we'll be, we'll be fine there. Um, just going back onto cone beam, what do you think after maybe, you know, you've been using it since 2008, what do you think the cases where it's not going to help someone out? You know, if you've taken a 2D, two-dimensional x-ray, what are those cases where there's absolutely no need to take a cone beam? Because that is a point of contention, I think, across um, across the world. You know, people are saying, oh, you're over-irradiating. Some people are saying you're under-irradiating. You know, people are taking pre-op, mid-op, post-op cone beam. Some people are just taking it, you know, pre-op. What, what's your... Um, kind of take because obviously you've done a large number of scans now so where do you fall in this uh, whole spectrum you know um to answer the first part of your question where it not be infor informationally necessary the answer is never cone beam is always informationally uh, beneficial you will always i don't care what the tooth is or what the condition you will always have more information because you see more with a cone beam. But the decision is when should you not use a cone beam? Yeah. When can you get away with not using a cone beam? And because of radiation concerns and whatnot. So I think a simple anterior tooth that, for example, has decay uh, into the pulp, uh, that looks relatively straightforward, I wouldn't use. But even then, I think the profession, the specialty is coming around to routinely using a pre-op cone beam CT. Radiation is still very low, much lower than it was 15 years ago. Yeah, I think that's the key, uh, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I would only take a mid-op CT on a very rare case. I can't think of one in the past year where I've taken one. You know, let's say it's calcified and you're drilling and you wonder if you're off-centered or not. Something like that is much better than a PA because you get to kind of see from that axial view if you're off or not. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, review images, recall images at one year or two years. The complexity that you can capture with a comb beam is much better than a periapical radiograph. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would tend to agree. I think, I think the... The real key in all of this is the you know we can now do four by fours, whereas it used to be what thirty two, uh, so yeah. you, you can get right down to the you know almost individualizing that tooth and maybe the adjacent structures and not having to radiate such a huge amount and obviously technology has moved on, we can now use a much lower 
dose so i mean if someone's using an old an old unit uh then maybe you still do have that that particular concern but i mean likewise if you're using an old pa unit uh then maybe you're maybe you should look at that if if, if that's you know a large concern to you absolutely yeah for sure um moving away from dentistry so you're obviously on your birthday your birthday today and you're, you're going away um which i hope is going to be very nice and restful for you what are the things that keep you grounded you know during all these different things how are you how are you keeping yourself kind of uh centered and 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 uh, having a good balance between work and and uh, the rest of your life you know the past three years um this app has taken up a tremendous amount of my time. So really a lot of my, my, my spare time is, uh, is devoted to getting this project uh, to a level I wanted to see at. Uh, there's been not much of a balance uh, over the past three years, but really before that, or at some point, travel is our passion. Both my wife and I, we'd love to travel. Um, we travel about five weeks a year. Uh, and we always try to choose at least one new destination we haven't been. And yeah. then the other three to four are, are creature comfort, cozy spots that we know has always worked for us. And it's a great time and we'll always have a great time. And we'll always go to, we, we do those. Um, I think um, I love movies. I'm a big movie buff. I love the genre of espionage. Uh, so I love to kind of watch movies. That's another passion of mine. Um, eating out at restaurants, um, kind of some of the stuff that, uh, a lot of people do. Uh, one of the things that I was hugely passionate about for about 12 years, uh, was the game of poker. I love playing poker. Uh, and, uh, I had a, a few friends, uh, dentists and non-dentists, and we used to have homely games and, and, and whatnot. So these are some of the ways I, I try to kind of, um, enjoy my spare time oh, outside of the yeah um where's the best place you've been to to visit then what do you think you know in, in all your travels the the best place um istanbul is one of my one of our top three cities uh that we've ever visited yeah and uh, <clears throat> london london is a place we love to go and before covid we would go there twice a year every June, every November. And I can never get enough of London. London is an unbelievable city, has a lot of energy, has a lot of charm to it. A lot of it is, uh, it brings sort of nostalgic memories of when I was eight years old. Um, and uh, so yeah, London, uh, Istanbul, um, I don't think I've been to a place that I haven't liked, um, you know, uh, something close to us, New York City, is always fantastic. Yeah, Toronto is a magical city. It's changed so much over the past twelve years. Um, so travel is just one of those uh, things that uh, that gets us excited. It's kind of been a bit of a bummer during this time, but uh, can't wait to get back out there. Yeah, I have to agree with you on uh, on Istanbul. Uh, I've been the once now. Um, I think back end of last year, I think it was November time. And it was, it was somewhere that I, you know, it's the first time you I've really been somewhere and gone, you know what, I, I could stay here. Um, you know, and, and it was it, maybe just because it was very much metropolitan, you know, I think people get a very skewed idea of what Turkey is and what Turkey's like, maybe from, you know, media reports and, and things like that. But I've honestly never been somewhere where there was so much variety in people, food, um, architecture is incredible. And the vibe of the city was very laid back. And I, I kind of really, really enjoyed that. And um, I think it's the largest, is it one of the largest cities on in the world? I think it's one of the largest metropolitan cities now, isn't it? You have to Google that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great place to go. I mean, the juxtaposition uh, I'll just give you an example. We um, went from our hotel to go to the Blue Mosque. Uh, the Blue Mosque opened at nine o'clock in the morning and we got there at around eight o'clock. We're like, okay, what do we do? So we just wandered onto a cobblestone, went into a place to have breakfast. We walked in 
And the entire place was so beautifully decorated and set up, it looked like it was a Hollywood movie set. And then we sat down and there was a brick wall that was kind of not perfect. And that brick wall was 600 years old. Mm -hmm. And you're sitting down, unbelievable music playing in the background, just relaxing music, and had the most delicious, simple, Turkish breakfast, just bread, cheese, tomatoes, cucumber, and tea. Yeah. And that's something you don't get in a lot of places. Yeah, I I, I really enjoyed kind of the, the variety of, uh, of cuisine as well, because, you know, there was all these tea, tea houses everywhere with the um, Turkish delights and baklava and, and all these different, different things. And they'd bring you... There was, there was. I remember one of the places that it was like a selection, and they brought one of ev one a small piece of everything, uh, so yeah. you could try all these different things. And the tea there, I it was it was so just like it was very relaxing. You're right. And I remember at the time I was writing a uh, what was I writing? I was writing some sort of PDF or something. Um, I can't actually remember what I was writing, but I, I managed to get through the whole thing because they would just bring me more of this. I remember it was pistachio and rose. Or pomegranate um, Turkish delight, and I was just munching on that and having a bit of tea yeah. and typing on my iPad away, and and I kind of got it clocked by the end of uh, a couple of uh, you know a couple of hours of I've just sat there because I was so in the zone. But I think you you have yeah. to be you have to be relaxed almost to get into that mode of work. So I've got really fond memories. Yeah, yeah, it was great. It was uh, it was just. Travel is an important, such an unbelievable experience. Mm. Um, fortunate to be able to do that. Yeah, and I think I think London is a, is definitely a place to visit. Uh, maybe not to live. I couldn't live in London. It's too too big. Uh, but yeah. I, I definitely enjoy going down. You know, to see friends and uh, a long weekend in London is uh, definitely great. Again, there's so much variety in the people, and and I think it always comes down to the food for me, doesn't it? <laughs> Yeah, it does. The food is great. So. Yeah, where, where's your first place that you're thinking you need to head out to after all of this uh, is over? Oh, definitely London. London. Definitely. You'll have to let me know. I'll, I'll try and head down. <laughs> of course, sure. No, I, I have a list of people that I am just so looking forward to meeting uh, from Luis Fernandez, but he, he's a bit away from London. But Krina Patel, Manji, you, the boys at Contemporary Endo, um, and uh, yeah, it's just, I, I don't care if my first opportunity is a Friday to Sunday, I'm going, we're going to make a trip to London, you know, just to kind of enjoy it for a day. Yeah. Uh, it, it'll be well worth it, for sure. Yeah, sometimes those short trips are uh, are actually the, the best because I, I suppose you can just fly straight into the city centre almost, can't you, from... Uh, from where you are and a fairly long flight I think is it seven eight hours uh, it's it's seven and a half one way and then with good wind under six hours the other way but we get to Heathrow but there's Heathrow Express the train mm. that within 15 minutes gets you to central London yeah yeah it's it's, it's worth going I think uh, I'll, I'll be down for sure I've got a lot of friends I, I haven't seen in uh, far too long because of all of this that I need to go uh, uh, visit for sure <laughs> we'll have to set up a uh, a dinner where we get everybody together and kind of make it a uh, a friendly meet and greet and have nice food and good cocktails and and just uh, shoot the shit. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm I'm definitely down for that. I, I'm I'm always up for a good meal for sure. Um, listen, I think it's been great. Hopefully, we've not had too many sound issues for the guys who've been listening. I, I think I think I managed to correct it by uh about halfway through somewhere in there uh been great speaking to you i definitely want to catch up with you again maybe at some point uh i think it'll be interesting to see how your app goes because i think it's going to make a huge amount of difference for everyone out there there's going to be a lot of kind of benefit towards patients and just giving that clinicians a little extra a little extra vote of confidence in in what they're doing and, and how they're going to be going about things so uh, I think everyone's very grateful for you to you for that. Thank you, thank you, Jabir. It's been my pleasure. I, I I look forward to coming back on and 
and talk chatting with you. And for anybody who's interested in the progress and the development of the app, the website is www.endogenie.ai. Or if you look at my Instagram profile, endogenie, the, the link in the bio is uh, will take you to the website and get more information and sign up for updates. Yeah, I'll put a link to your uh, Instagram and I'll put the link to that in the description of the video as well so people can check that out. Um, I think one question that we asked before uh before I, I i like to let people go is that i found a couple of nice ones uh what was there that i should have asked you that i didn't know enough to ask um the i think you actually knew quite a bit about me so <laughs> uh I, I think i think we covered a lot but the one question that i seem to always get and I never really have a good answer for it, so I'm glad you didn't ask it, is why did you go into dentistry? I like, haven't why got an answer for that either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know. You know, who knows what uh, a 20-year-old's thinking? You know, there are a couple of you. But the, the, the reason is that at that time, I felt that lifestyle balance were more in line with the profession of dentistry than in medicine. Mm. Little did mm. I know that that's really not the case, you know, 20 years later, that you have to create balance in whatever field you're in. Uh, but that's probably the best answer. Yeah, I, I think I have that same, you know, someone's actually messaged me the other day asking, you know, um, she's applying to dentistry and I've not got back to her yet. She sent me a, a list of questions and I was looking at them going, I don't, I don't really have answers for any of these. These are very, um, you know, why did I go to dentistry? I, I honestly, I didn't want to do medicine. I <laughs> think that was... Yeah. That was the reason. I don't, I'm not sure it's the best particular uh, reason to go into something. And yeah, like you say, the lifestyle it sounded sounded ideal to me. And we have, you know, some form of microsurgery. I think that's that's something yeah. that's interesting. Um, without having to do night shifts, so that's probably the only reason. Not the only reason. You know, the, there's probably you know biases within my grow. You know, um, my life where I've grown up where you know, everyone's some sort of medic or, or dentist or in healthcare in, in the family that there was always some bias when we were being brought up that we were going to end up doing something similar because yeah. that's kind of what we know and what we're uh, about. Uh, but like, like you say, there are, you have to bring in your own, your own work-life balance. And for me, that's now doing podcasts, hopefully semi-professionally, hopefully, you know, for a long time to come. I see making get on top of these audio issues anyway. <laughs> well, uh, you know, that always happens, like you said, with technology upgrades, but you definitely have a good, uh, good pulse on, on this aspect of interaction. It's been very easy and comfortable interacting and chatting with you. So I'm uh, very optimistic that you're going to go places with this man. Yeah. Just keep thank it up. you. And hopefully we'll, we'll catch up with you soon in London. If not, I'm, I'm sure to head over back to the States at some point. Um, but that we'll call it a day for there because I don't want to take up too much of your birthday. Thank you guys if you've been watching live. For anyone who's been watching the uh, replay, uh, apologies for this little bits of uh, audio interference there. I'm trying to find the fix for that. I'm sure we will get to the bottom of it. Um, make sure to follow Reza. He's on Instagram. He's also going to stick his uh, link to the endogenie.ai app in the description after I've finished. And uh, hopefully that will help you guys out with your endodontic diagnosis and just getting the right, the right diagnosis and the right treatment to your patients. Um, if you've been enjoying the stuff that I've been doing on uh, YouTube and on Instagram, make sure you're following all the pages for uh, first. Share the video, hit that like button, subscribe if you're new and the notification bell. We've got plenty more guests coming up. And if you're really, really enjoying it, have a little look at the link in the bio to the Patreon group where we've got a, a small but growing group of dentists in a uh, chat room and uh, some other benefits as well. So we've got some discounts from different companies. And uh, I also do one-on-one -on -one Instagram growth tutorials for people looking to get patients in the door. So have a little look at that. Uh, but hopefully you've enjoyed this one and huge thank you again to Reza 